What I wanted was proof. Did Jesus say so? I got into a discussion with a man who used to have a radio program on the Bible. And so I asked him if he could prove to me some of the things he believed. He said, I don't have a Bible. I said, I have one here. I put a Bible, which is called a red letter edition. They put all of the words of Jesus in red ink. And I'd ask him, do you believe such and such? And he'd say, certainly, here's the proof. And he'd open up the Bible and he'd read me something from the black ink. And I kept saying, no, show me in the red ink. Did Jesus say that thing? I said, I know Paul said it. I know this and that and the other thing. Did Jesus say that thing you tell me you believe? Well, he kept stroking my Bible like it was a pet cat. I was very fond of it. But I kept pushing that way and pushing. I kept saying, did Jesus say it? And suddenly he didn't like the Bible anymore and he threw it back in my face. He said, you know what your problem is? You won't believe it unless Jesus said it. Yes, that's my problem. It should be his problem. How does he dare to teach something if he can't sh and call himself a Christian if he can't show you that Jesus said this thing he's talking about? It should be easy to find if Jesus said some of the things people say he said. It should be easy to find. Do you know if you took all the words of Jesus reported in the Bible and eliminate the duplications because you have the same story basically told four times, if you eliminate the duplications, the total of all the words of Jesus do not even fill two columns of a newspaper. There's not very many words. So if he said these different things, you don't really have a lot of work to look down and find them. So as I say, among Protestant churches, I have been involved with the Church of England, the Presbyterians, Pentecostals, Baptists, Jehovah's Witnesses, Christadelphians, you name them. You probably can't name one I haven't heard of unless it's something local here. To be involved with them for nine years. I read their books and visited, took part in their meeting, used to teach some of their Bible classes. I kept coming back to this, what proof? do you offer? What proof? So they bring out a handful of their favorite verses. John 3, 16, 8, 58, 10, 30, 14, and 9, 20, and 28, and so on. But for every one of those verses, there's another verse, which if you put it right beside that verse, you find out what they were trying to say won't work. Hebrews 11, 17, uh, Exodus chapter 3, uh, uh, John chapter 17, John chapter 5, and uh, Exodus chapter 6 to go in the order of the verses I named you there. You put those beside those verses and the argument dissolves, among others. They don't prove the divinity of Jesus. doesn't mean he's not divine. But these things don't do the job. That's the problem. I'm not saying he's not divine. I'm saying I still want to see the proof. Did he say so? Then the real test of sincerity was what disappointed me. You see, you can take one of these verses, somebody shows you um, John 14 and 9, for example. Jesus said to Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So I asked them, how is it he said in this other place to a group of people, you people have never seen the Father? Don't tell me in this place he means he's God, when in this place he told some people who were looking at him, you've never seen God. He must have meant something else. You tell somebody that and they'll say, okay, you have a point. What about this verse? And they go to another verse. It's fine. But next week, somebody will come to that same man and say, where's the proof that Jesus said he was God? He will read John 14 and 9, right back where he started from. A verse which a week ago he told me wasn't good enough. It'll be good enough for somebody else because he hopes he doesn't know the response I had. Beginning about 1969, the same story I seem to get when I go from church to church. I'd ask them, you know, if you took all the words of Jesus and you cut them out of the Bible with the scissors, and then I gave you some paste and told you, put them back together any way you like. Take all these words, put them back together, paste them together how you like. You still can't make him spell out the Trinity. He still doesn't say anything about it, no matter how you change these words. And so they'd tell me, it doesn't mean it isn't true. The Trinity is an evolved understanding. The church didn't understand this deep thought at first, the understanding evolved over the centuries. It was discussed. People came to understand it and believe it. Fine. But if that's what you say, you shouldn't say, on the other hand, Jesus used to preach it. If you tell me people didn't figure it out for 200 years, don't tell me Jesus preached it. And so they would say, no, no, he preached it, but it's not in the Bible. He used to preach it to his disciples. He told them about it. 
Well, in the 18th chapter of John, Jesus says very clearly, I taught nothing in secret. He said, everything I had to say, I said in the marketplace. He didn't tell his disciples any secrets. More solutions are offered to me. People told me, your problem is you're not spiritual enough. Believe. Then it's easy. Believe. Well, you see, a person can't make themselves believe if they know better. What sometimes happens to human beings, they get a pain, so their head is hurting. They go to a doctor, they tell him, I've got this pain, it won't go away. The doctor makes some tests, a full examination, maybe some x-rays, and he finds there's nothing wrong. So he realizes the man's problem is mental. It's an imaginary pain. He doesn't tell the man that. He gives him a placebo. They are things that look like pills, but they're only milk sugar, just sugar. He goes to his patient and he says, we've made some tests, this is the medicine you need. Take these pills and in one day your pain should stop. It almost always does. Because the man thinks he's getting some medicine. And so his mental abilities get rid of the pain. That's a placebo. It works that way. I can't do the same thing with belief though. I can't manufacture it. You see, if the doctor came to me and he said, you know, your problem is mental. I have some sugar pills here. Believe that these are medicine with all your heart. Believe they are medicine. Try very hard. And when you believe that they are medicine, the pain will go away. I can't do it. He told me they're sugar. I know better. So in the same way, it's not satisfactory that somebody comes and he says, believe, believe, believe. How can you believe if you know better? Faith overcomes, people told me. Faith overcomes. You must be born again. And that I took a real interest in. You must be born again. I want to know how does this work? Where is the proof in the scripture? It brought me Romans chapter 8. It's very interesting. Romans chapter 8, Paul says, if you are born again, what happens is the Spirit of God comes into you and it tells you that God is now your Father. And so you cry out, Abba, Father. So this is how it's supposed to work. It's fascinating. I gave that a lot of thought. But I got to thinking about this word Abba. It's unusual. It means Father in Aramaic. So I looked up the word Abba. Where else is it in the Bible? Well, there's only one other place that Paul talks about Abba. I'll let you find it for yourself. One other place he talks about Abba. And in this place, he also talks about how it is that this thing works. He says, the Spirit of God comes within you, you become a child of God, you call out to God, Abba, Father, now God is your Father. And he goes on to say, now you have a new mother also, a new mother. God is your Father and you have a mother. Since 1969 till now, 15 years, I have yet to meet someone who's born again and ask them, who's your father? They say, God. I say, who's your mother? They don't know. Why not? It's in the Bible. It says you have a new mother if you're born again. Why did the Spirit of God, when it came within you, forget to tell you who was your mother? It's there. I'll let you find it. It's there. It's important. You see, in Islam, if you call a man a liar, you better have proof or you're the one that's in trouble. If somebody over there calls me a liar, he better have proof, you see, unless he's not a Muslim. If other religions permit you to call that name without proof, that's their business. Now. As I say, for many years I went directly to priests and ministers from about 1969 till 77, thereabouts. And round and round we go. I don't want to bore you with a lot of the conversations, but they go around in tiny little circles and it's disappointing. People ask me, they say, who was the father of Jesus? I say, he didn't have a father. And they say, well then, you see, Mary is the mother, God is the father. So I would ask, you mean Mary is the wife of God? No, oh, they're horrified. No, 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 no. God is the father. Mary is the mother. And I'd ask, you mean his, his parents weren't married, though? No, God doesn't take a wife. So we go on to something else. And they say, but Jesus called God father. And I always ask people who tell me that, I say, what do you call God? Probably it's father. People who say that, they pray, our father. 
But he called himself son of God, they say. And I tell him, yes, and he called lots of other people son of God. He said, blessed are the peacemakers. They shall be called sons of God. I became very frustrated on the crucifixion. I believe that the crucifixion happened, but I want to know why. Ask so many people, I said, why did God have to become a man and die? If a price has to be paid for our sins, why can't we just go find a sinless man and execute him? And say, there, the price is paid. To which people always said, no, if a man dies, it's not enough. It has to be someone who is God and man. And so I'd always ask them, do you mean God died? Say, no, 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 only the man died. We're back where we started from. If a man dies, it isn't good enough. See, that's a... That's not a novel idea on my part. The church is still discussing that till this day. They're still not sure who died on the cross. Was it God or was it man or was it a God man or what was the deal? Because it can't, if God doesn't die, because that means changing from one state to another, and God doesn't change from one state to another, he's supposed to be immutable and so on. They're still discussing that. They say Jesus paid a price for your sins. Paid a price. Could never understand that. In the Lord's Prayer, Jesus taught his disciples how to pray. He said, pray like this. And one of the lines he told them, he said, pray to God, say, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. More modern translations say, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. How do you forgive someone who owes you a debt? Do you say, you know that money you owe me? Forget it. Now give me the money. Right? If you forgive it, it's that there's no price. Nothing is paid. It's forgiven. So the Lord's Prayer says, forgive us our sins the same way we forgive someone who sinned against us. If someone slaps you and you forgive him, that's the end of that. But you don't say, I forgive you for slapping me. Now come here, I want to slap you. You see? You don't do that. About, what would it be, 500 years ago, there was a Jew in Europe. Spinoza was his name, Baruch Spinoza, a philosopher, and he wrote a great deal. He made the same point that people were making 500 years before him. He was frustrated when the Christians would come to him and say, God became man. He would say, what do you mean? God became man. See, I know what is God and I know what is man. And I can imagine that what was God turned into a man. It's not God anymore. He used to be God. Now he's a man. I can understand that. That at least makes some sense. But that's not what the church teaches. They say, God became man, but he was still God. And that causes a problem. You see, if I have a ball of clay, and I squeeze it, and I put corners on it, and I make it into a cube, I can tell you, you see, the ball became a cube. But I can't tell you, don't be fooled, it's still round. See, if it was one thing, it became another thing, it's not that thing anymore. They solve that by putting a label on it. They call it diophysitism. Doesn't prove anything. It means two natures. Diophysitism. That's an old trick. When you don't know the answer, put a label on it. In ancient Greece, the Greeks, 25 centuries ago, came to their scientists with a question. They'd observed that you eat food, it goes through the system, and some of it comes out. They wanted to know which part of what I take in is the part that feeds me because evidently I don't need all of it, you see. Well, now, which is the nutritive faculty of the food? And the scientists didn't know, so they said, the part that feeds you is the nutritive faculty of the food. It's like saying the part that feeds you is the part that feeds you. It's all. It's a label. It doesn't answer anything. As I say, I could talk to you for hours about experiences. About 1977, I decided to have a look at the Quran. I never met a Muslim. I lived 100 kilometers from the nearest Muslim. See, what interested me was what non-Muslims said about Muhammad. There are books and books written about Muhammad that tell you, one thing we know for sure about this man, he had an outside source of information. One book I've got says the Quran was written by a committee. Because they've established so well that there's information in there that an Arabian shouldn't have known. He must have had someone from the outside bringing him this information. 
So say, one thing we know for sure, he had an outside source of information. Now he said this book was a revelation. So they say, you see, he was a liar. He got it from somewhere, he put it in a book, and he gave it to someone, telling him it was from God. He was a liar. Other people write books and books on the subject of Muhammad, and they say, one thing we know for sure, he thought he was a prophet. He was crazy. Because they look at his life very carefully, and they see episodes like, for example, when he hid in the cave with Abu Bakr. He was running from the whole city who wanted to kill him, and he hid in the cave. And when the Meccans came running up to the cave to kill them, what did he say to his friend? Did he tell him, see if you can find a back way out of the cave? What he told his friend was, relax. He was telling him, you know, I see what you see. But he said, God is with us. God will save us. So people on that basis, they say, you see, he thought he was a prophet. He thought God was with him because he said things like that. He wasn't a liar. They never seem to realize that one man can't be both. So you can't be a liar and a crazy man at the same time. If you think that an angel gives the words of God in your ear, and somebody says, I have a question for you. What does God tell you about this thing? I will want to hear an answer tomorrow. If you are a crazy man, if you think an angel whispers in your ear, then you don't sit up that night thinking, what will I tell him tomorrow? What can I find? Who knows the answer? You're crazy. You think the angel will tell you the answer. You don't go and look it up somewhere. You see, you can't be a liar and a crazy man at the same time. You can be one or the other or neither, but you can't be both. You see, I read two non-Muslim biographies of Muhammad. One was by Rodinson, who's an atheist, who hated the man. But many interesting things come up about his life that I had to wonder about. One story that's told is that when he was an older man, he had a son named Ibrahim, Abraham. The son died when the child was two years old. The same day the boy died, there was an eclipse of the sun. The sky went dark. And the Muslims came running to their prophet and said, Look, it's a miracle. Your child died and the sky went dark in sadness. It occurred to me, see, if he was a crazy man, he'd probably believe what they said. He'd probably think, yes, it's a miracle. My child died, the sky is dark. Yes, it's a miracle. If he was a crazy man. If he was a liar, he would have taken advantage of it. He would have said, yes, right, my child died, the sky is dark, you tell everyone, it proves I'm a prophet. It's a miracle. But what did he do? He became angry with the Muslims. He told them that was nonsense. He was angry with them. How dare you say that? He said, the sun and the moon are signs of God, and they don't worry themselves about the birth of a man or the death of a son of Muhammad. Doesn't look very crazy. Doesn't look much like a liar. Now you have a third alternative, of course, which people tell you all the time. You say, no, he was not a liar. He was not a crazy man. He was deceived by the devil. Deceived by the devil. It's an interesting idea. But whatever you say, you better be ready to back it up. There's a lot of difficulties with that idea. For example, there is a verse in the Quran which tells the reader about a good habit to develop, it tells him, before you read this book, always say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajim, which means, I take refuge in God from Satan, the rejected. Is this Satan who wrote this? Who said, before you read my book, ask God to save you from me? Is that Satan who wrote that? As Jesus said, if Satan is divided against himself, then his kingdom will fall. He's fighting against his own interests. So let me finish with a point that, a story that illustrates a point. As I said, there's many theories and many explanations around, many explanations. But an explanation, something somebody tells you, is just so much air coming out of his mouth unless he has proof and unless he offers you something that you can use to falsify it. You see, there's many theories of how do the planets go around the sun and how do the stars burn and all the rest of it. Many theories. 
Most of them are just so much wind, scientists pay no attention to them because they don't contain something that could be checked to prove it false. You see, Einstein was considered an intelligent man because when he offered his theory in 1905 and again in 1915, he didn't just offer a theory, he said, here's three ways to prove I'm wrong. Now it's worth listening to. He's told me, here's three different things you can do. If you can do this, I'm wrong. Here you are. Is there anything like that in Christianity? Has the Christian ever said, you want to prove I'm wrong? All you have to do is this. Has he ever done that? The Quran is filled with that kind of thing, filled with it. Saying, you want to prove this book is wrong? Do this. Prove it. Go ahead. Do it. Filled with that kind of thing. There's an example of it that made a big impression in its day. During the lifetime, 14 centuries ago, of the Prophet of Islam, you see, he had an uncle named Abu Lahab, that was his nickname, Abu Lahab. This man hated Muhammad, he hated anything the man said. He used to watch him going through the city, and if he saw him talking to someone, he waited till they split up. He'd go after the man he spoke to and take him and say, what did Muhammad tell you? Whatever it is, it's a lie. Did he tell you day? It's night. Did he say black? It's white. Exact opposite. Whatever he heard the Muslims say, he said the opposite. That was the way his mind worked. There's a little chapter of the Quran called Lahab, and it says about this man that he'll never change. It condemns him to hell, Jahannam. You see, if the man had ever become a Muslim, the Muslims would believe, well, now he's not condemned anymore. You see, for ten years before Abu Lahab died, that was a part of the Quran. And the Muslims could come to Abu Lahab and say, do you know, it's been revealed to us in, your, in our book that you will never be a Muslim. God says you will never be a Muslim. For ten years they told him that. All he had to do was say, well, your book is wrong. I want to be a Muslim. What do you think of your book now? That's all he had to do. He had ten years to think about it. And that's the way he was. See, if somebody is your enemy, you don't come to them and say, you want to prove I'm wrong? Here, say this. Come on, say it. If all you have to do is say the words and I'm wrong, you finish me. He never did it. See, this is one of many cases of something that was offered that could have been falsifiable. So it was. As I say, in 1978, after... How long would that be? Fifteen years of arguing with the church authorities, one place or another. I got the idea. I'm going to argue with some other people. I'm going to read the Koran, see how much of it is any good. Pick out the true, pick out the false. Thought it'll take a few years, it'll take some serious study and so on. I read through it. About three days later, I finished it. I said, this is what I've been saying for 15 years. So I went to find some Muslims. I don't want somebody to feel you've been tricked into something. I haven't said anything about Christianity that isn't true. I haven't said anything about Islam that isn't true unless it was a slip of the tongue or something. I'm simply trying to remind an individual, don't close your mind before it's too late. Don't make up your mind before you have all the facts. Most people who used to be Christians and become Muslims will tell you, I am a better Christian than I used to be. Now I follow Christ, I didn't before. That's what I would tell you. The Bible says Jesus told his disciples, when you greet one another, let your greeting be, peace be with you. He set the example, peace be with you. Who says that today? Christians? Once in a great while, maybe. Muslims, whether they speak Arabic or not, they say, Salaam Alaikum. Peace be with you. Jesus, when he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, put his forehead on the ground. Who prays like that, Christians or Muslims? Jesus used to fast for more than a month at a time. Who fasts today? Christians or Muslims? Who really is trying to imitate Jesus? Somebody said to me uh, before coming in here, they said, uh, the Muslims make Jesus out, uh, they insult him and so on and so on. How possibly do they insult him? They lift him up, up. They can't tolerate anything bad said about him. They would just as quickly tell you that, you know, the, the, they say Muhammad Rasulullah means Muhammad is the messenger of God. They will just as quickly say, Isa, Jesus, Isa, Rasulullah, no problem. 
just as quickly tell you that? Because it's true. They occupy the same place. If God himself wants to make distinctions among his prophets, that's his business, not ours. Treat them all with the same amount of respect. May God guide us always closer to the truth.